going to go through a lot, and I see that a lot of folks, this is a packed room, a lot of folks are really looking forward to this. So I'm going to do my best. We're going to learn some ecto in production together, and it's going to be fun. But uh, so uh, those who don't know me, I am uh, David Bernheisel. We're going to talk about ecto in production, particularly around migrations, big scary topic. It's going to be okay. We'll get through it together. Um, and here's what we're covering today. So please decide with me, since it's kind of like standing room in here, please decide now if you want to stick with me live or catch me later on like the recording. That's okay too. So what we're going to do is we're going to capture, uh, we're going to go over that one bad migration, you know, then why culture matters. We're going to talk about locks and transactions, uh, keys to safe data migrations, and then finally some tools. All right. So if none of that interests you, you can peace out now. My, my, my feelings will not be hurt. All right, so the only credential that you need to know about me is that like I and many others, uh, were, I'm, I'm a highly decorated loser of production data. <laughs> I have brought production down multiple times due to bad migration. So that is my credential of why I get to talk about this, okay? You get to learn my, my lessons. All right, so you've seen it happen, a bad migration that locks up production for an uncomfortable amount of time. Uh, you feel bad. The folks that help you get unstuck kind of feel bad for you. Uh, the customers are a little confused uh, of why the now unresponsive app won't like respond to clicks. Uh, the, the CTO has to be briefed <laughs> on what is happening. You know, someone's crying, uh, someone else is fleeing. Uh, it's, it's a bad day, right? Uh, I've seen it a lot. And Honestly, I think there's a bigger problem than that bad migration itself. And, it's, and it, it's, it's how we treat the incident itself. I too often see uh, that the, the system, being the people system, has, uh, is indirectly punishing the person that is committing what is typically pegged as a human error, right? And I suspect many of you can actually relate to that. So here's a story. Poor David. <laughs> David found the search form on the app was having a lot of sequential scans, right? Good going, David. Your foresight of setting up for observability and supreme knowledge of SQL, you know, uh, has taught you how to trace those queries and use explain, analyze, right? David has decided to add the index uh, to a column that was being used a lot in search. So he writes up a migration, submits it for merging. The app is set up to automatically run migrations upon boot. That's good. Smart team. Good going, David, right? Okay. <laughs> that was a little low, right? A little, little victory fanfare there. That was great. Uh, David wasn't intentionally sabotaging the system, right? He wasn't knowingly taking unnecessary risks. David was just trying to do a good job. It's been a long day. So he decides to peace out for a while, for a long lunch. Meanwhile, the PR gets merged and automatically deployed. Unfortunately, David forgot to put that concurrently true option on that index, right? And this large table has a lot of read and writes going on. It's kind of a, it's kind of a central table. So uh, yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> Creating indexes, by the way, will block read and writes in Postgres if it's not done concurrently. So this index is locking the table while it's running. Um, so let's think about that. Let's think. Let's keep thinking. Yep. Keep thinking. A ticking time bomb. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that was 30 seconds, right? So imagine that kind of anxiety for 13 and a half minutes. 
It was just a simple mistake, right? Uh, but David gets to meet uh, three new bosses. He didn't know yet. <laughs> he gets to recount the incident for each of them, one for his real boss, uh, one for the CTO and the entire engineering team, uh, one for the head of sales and marketing uh, to help them work through the customers that, you know, noticed the downtime. Uh, and I would bet that a majority of these, uh, post, are, are, of these cases are post-mortem into, um, into human error with a lot of stuff uh, that is uh, going to be added after there to prevent this human error from happening again, right? Human error being that David missed a configuration option, right? AKA uh, complacency, that little weasel word of complacency. So let's think through the outward changes that this downtime probably led to. All right, number one, CTO wants to understand the issue and similar issues, right? It's reasonable to surmise that the team fell into a common trap. So we need to identify these common traps. Right? Uh, and so we can avoid them. As long as we know what we're looking at, we can avoid them. We don't want another outage. Since, uh, number two, since we work with humans with frail memories, it's reasonable to build tools that avoid traps. An enthusiastic developer uh, might decide to write a migration linter. This is good. Uh, number three, clearly the error was introduced by a person. So the database was fine before someone decided to muck with it. <laughs> Uh, so we need to adopt the process to be a little extra vigilant uh, before migrations. So, so like any company process, those who don't follow the process should face compliance, right? <laughs> Maybe this process is using a tool like GitHub or adjusting the GitHub co code owner's file uh, for anything under the migrations folder, right? And uh, some super sequelers uh, will get to review them. Uh, this talk description actually suggests that these are the natural steps in order to prevent bad migrations from happening, that if you do these things, you'll be fine. Um, and that this process is inevitable due to growth. And of course, every company wants to grow. And defining the growth phase is a little complicated, right? On one hand, it's exciting because it uh, means that we're going to be opening ourselves to bigger problems to solve. Yeah. Brain exercise with a high chance of money falling into my pocket. <laughs> One, on the other hand, though, it means the human-centric, small-team mindset could be sacrificed a little bit for logical processes. So here's the unsaid belief system that I think these growth-centric actions lead to, that if we separate the person in the logic and follow logic, it can't lead to bad culture. But I think that's a fallacy, right? I, I, you've, you've removed the person from, from the, ingredient, you know, the ingredient list here. That's, that's kind of required for culture, for good culture, too. So this, this fallacy is commonly coupled with data-driven decision-making, right? These are all things we think are good. And that if you make 100% of your decisions based on data, you might also be stifling intrinsic motivation, right? Important key to happiness for, for folks. So let's think about it from your perspective. If there was someone on your team that had a bad, a bad migration, or two, maybe three, <laughs> Uh, would you avoid having them run migrations for a while? <laughs> yeah, it makes sense, right? They were exposed to increased risk. Uh, there was a fumble. So let's reduce risk by limiting um, the riskier options that they do. Makes sense. Uh, which unfortunately includes their growth opportunities, right? What if someone on your team made several mistakes in a row over a month? Would you trust them with the next decision? If you're a manager, would these mistakes show up on their performance review later? All right. And because we're so afraid of having the same incident occur again, the company has decided to protect its value by buying some off-the-shelf tooling uh, and require everyone to use those things. So, right, all enterprise companies use these tools, and we're becoming enterprisey, so we should uh, act like a big company now, right? Uh, and, and would you want to have that mistake-ridden developer <laughs> go through additional processes to filter out that badness, whatever they're doing, right? And I, and I mean, like, most policy and process is introduced because of that one guy, right? Um, so it makes sense for developers, too. Like, right, let's, maybe let's add more engineers to code reviews that include migrations. Uh, this translates to uh, those, super, those super sequelers, like, who were just other engineers. They're being roped into these kind of, like, pre-DevOps roles, right? They may not want that. Um, you need a... I have literally seen worse decisions made to avoid a migration, right? Because it now involves other teams to review the code. Uh, and they're too busy, right? So need a new column to support search? Nah, now nah, just stuff it into an existing H store column or something, you know, it'll be, it'll be all right. 
Yeah, so let's walk through the earlier logical reactions, right? Identifying traps. All right, systems are not safe by default. We have to make them safe. Logically, identifying traps makes sense. You're proactively seeking out the unsafe issues before the team stumbles into them. But what if you haven't found the trap? <laughs> like, you know, David was educated to write a simple Phoenix half, right? I wasn't, and I'm not, I'm not trained to hunt down inefficient database indexes. Like, I certainly don't want to be the one to fall into the trap and introduce myself to the CTO via an incident. You know, last time I talked to them, uh, we were so tired of interviewing, we just talked about baseball. <laughs> so, like, let's face it, like, we're not this guy, right? He was specifically trained and educated on how to hunt down, right? We, we weren't. And besides that, like, unfortunately, software rots over time, right? Constantly changes, and your, unique, your environment is unique. It's so, like, I know this because I've experienced it. You, you have too. It's also been studied uh, back in Amos's day of 40 years ago, right? In the 80s. A fellow named Barry Bone coined this in his 1981 book uh, called Software Engineering Economics. And the TLDR is the economics of changing software. Fix that fixing bugs or updates after the software is deployed. Remember, this is like 40 years ago, so our process is like way different. Um, it costs a lot more after it's deployed, which is like our bread and butter. We constantly <laughs> to make changes. And I want you to notice that graph is logarithmic, right? It, software rot creates this risk and new scenarios just simply by standing still. So we know this in our gut, but we have some study in it uh, as well. All right, but even without software rot, here's an example of a unique environment. My table of UUIDs works for me because I have cheap storage, online, right, big computers. But if you're working on like a Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Zero, recording sensor values, that's a lot of data coming in, right? You probably don't want to use UUIDs because of these stats. UUIDs take more, 25% more storage, and after about a million records, they insert 75% slower. Of course you don't want that, right? And the, the trap, in my case, large, cheap storage, small database table, that, that, that trap of running out of, of IDs, that big serial you know, or integers you know, usually come with, that doesn't exist in my scenario. So it, it's not universal. Again, you're not this guy. <laughs> so don't, don't expect to be. So by, by saying that we've identified the traps, it implies that those that fall into the trap fail the basic step of knowing what they're looking at. A judgment has been cast. All right, so for the developer, this translates to increased anxiety. This is why migrations suck, right? For the, you know, uh, yeah, it leads to folks just being afraid to do what's necessary. Instead, so let's set up an education program for your developers. Invest in them by letting them invest in themselves. Education, well, we know this, this is not new. Education is, is uh, intelligence tooling to enable the developers to feel prepared and confident and knowing how to react, right? Knowing what tools are available to them to fix the problems that will inevitably happen. If an incident occurs, blame and improve the education, not the person. So we're going to re revisit that. All right. Next thing, building tools. Like, I get so, so excited when I hear this. Like, this is my next favorite shiny little project that I'm going to do. I'm going to build this little tool. It's going to be cool. It's going to fix everyone's problems. It's going to be great. Building tools is uh, logical, right? Of course, I want these tools to help me offload my memory, the knowledge I have in here. I'm going to offload it into some software, uh, more permanent than my brain. And uh, that's, why, why, that's why we make tools. So let's look at a couple tools that we already use, Elixir and Ecto. All right, when I call an Elixir function that has multiple pattern matching heads, um, but I call it with a pattern that doesn't match, I get an error message. This gives me all the clauses that it tried. It's perfect, it's helpful, this is great, but unfortunately, the error has already occurred. <laughs> it's right there, right? Um, the, pr the process to getting here, it doesn't really help us. Right? The error has occurred. Our perp our, what we're wanting to do is to avoid the error, right? The goal is to have the error, the, the tool prevent the errors, right? The messaging here is incredible, but where it happens in time is not as helpful. All right, uh, telling me what I could have done after the error occurred is a bit counterfactual to what has happened. It doesn't really help. Don't build a tool to tell you what you did wrong. Perhaps this is why we're investigating, we have a team investigating types in Elixir. That'd be interesting, right? Okay, let's look at an Ecto example. If I try to create an index concurrently but left it wrapped in the migration lock, um, which is a database transaction for Postgres, um, we get a warning. And this is wonderful. Since I run migrations locally first, it gives me the warning ahead of time before it actually happens in production. This is a great example of tooling that can help guide developers into good directions without forcing them uh, into a tunnel, 
and it doesn't require them to adjust their process, right? Build a tool to warn you against bad possible futures. Equip developers with tools they may use, not require to use. All right, so here's the idea. So before you go building your tool, you need to build your process and then build the tools to support that process. You know, our earlier example of like that over-enthusiastic like developer that created that migration linter, like that's good, that's a good tool, but the process of using that matters more, right? You don't want it to be a tool that you just have to remember to, to, to run, because that's gonna, that's gonna lead to failure. All right, so don't miss my point, right? Incorporating tools to find mistakes is good, um, but the source of trouble could also be the process and not the, not the tooling or the lack of tooling, right? It's, uh, it's kind of like being too fat for a pair of jeans, right? Yeah, you got that little, that little spillover, that little muffin top. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you, no one's arguing that jeans are bad, right? <laughs> you don't get rid of the jeans. Your goal is to fit in those old jeans well, right? So you need a process to slim down a little bit, right? Uh, a regular process. All right. Okay, the other one. Uh, of course you need a process, right? Of course you know this. So, like, so most of the time this looks like a simple CI system with pass-fail checks. This is great. But let's think about uh, bigger teams. Now have it, having a process can evolve, right? Process can look like this. You create a branch, make some changes, you push it, you wait 20 minutes, you get pinged by a Slack bot about an ir irrelevant error, you go to your homegrown build system, you hit retry, you get pinged again with a wall of Unicode wrap and Python 3 error text. <laughs> that contains a custom Ruby exception implemented through a method missing found in a punky patch that's describing a Go runner's exception when running a different Ruby's project slap on type error system for a language that doesn't have types. <laughs> I didn't make this up. This literally exists, and I've run into it. Uh, and it turns out I just misindented a YAML. <laughs> <laughs> Awful process, right? All these extra tools and processes, though, can make um, uh, make it necessary to keep a smooth running system, right? Maybe, maybe it's needed, but let's face it, like developers have to invest a lot of time learning these tools in order to, to get this Elixir, Elixir and Ecto service like up there. So let me, make, let me make the consequence a little bit more obvious, right? Ignore the proprietary word here. If, if developers need custom knowledge only applicable to your company to succeed and you stretch this out over 10 and 20 years, you are sabotaging their success of those people in their future. The knowledge of how something works will eventually be replaced with the knowledge of how to configure the company's abstraction layers to make it work. Like, like imagine, man, we're, we're in a season called inflation, right? Do you think that developers will be able to put, like, I ran this X proprietary system on their resume? No one's gonna care about that, right? The silver lining, though, is that you get concepts and, ex and experience, but that's not very practical. And I, and I don't mean proprietary tools like AWS or GitHub or Google AdWords. That's transferable. What I mean is the tech that your company builds that only your company needs to know about. The skills to use AWS is transferable. The skills to configure your proprietary three layers of abstractions, not very transferable. So in other words, propri uh, prioritize people over process, right? Equip people with knowledge that lasts a lifetime, not company time. Process is designing the flow of progress into the direction you want, but people are the flow. One way you can be proud of yourself is by being better to people than to a process. If I implement a process that frustrates my people, I have failed. So, bad, frustrating process for the benefit of the company. Good, success for its people, which in turn goes to success for the company. This is really easy to say, really difficult to do. So, all right, so, so far I've, I've just complained. Let's look at some uh, more practical solutions. Let's, how can we do better? When the next bi bad migration happens, here are some better next steps. The response to error should be healing, including the second victim, which is the person who messed up. Error is arranged from trivial to traumatic and everybody responds differently. The junior developer, the perfectionist, the economically challenged, they're gonna take it hard. They need healing to get their humanity back. Right, we paused for 30 seconds, but that anxiety just builds and builds and that was over 13 minutes, you know? They are a complete wreck after production is back up. They need healing. And healing will build your team faster than anything else I know. 
a great example. HBO Max <laughs> sent an email to all their customers. And you know the response to that was? It was grace. It was good. The response was like, we've all been there. <laughs> That's good. That's healing. That's a little bit of healing, right? It's a rare moment of society. You know, do that. All right, ask what is responsible, not who is responsible. The person who encountered the error should explain it with complete context since the only one that knows how we got there. Was it too much pressure? Were they too distracted? Not enough education around databases? Only they know, right? What is responsible, not who is responsible. With this perspective, you realize that the failure isn't necessarily a linear chain of events that led to failure, but it's an insufficient system of support for the developer. Systems thinking, but for incidents, right? All right, last thing is forward-looking accountability. Someone needs to take responsibility, right? People are not the problem to control, though. They are the solution. Don't look back at the incident anymore. It's done. Nothing's going to change it. It's time to look forward. Instead, something needs to take the, risk, the, the accountability. The error is technical, organizational, educational, maybe even political. It's not a personal issue. They are part of the problem. Or sorry, part, they are part of the solution. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so an improved system should be what takes uh, a responsibility, right? For example, improve your migration process and educational material, like Linners. Put it in, put it in your, your process. That's fine. Do that. Okay. That was a lot of soft skill -y thing. All right. There's a lot more in this book. I highly recommend it. It's The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error by Sidney Decker. So enough about culture problems around migrations. To recap, the most important thing I want you to come away with this talk is that migration so it's not something to be afraid of. All right, when they do occur, they're revealing process, probably process issues, not personal issues. So let's think about some technical tips. All right, so first, before I dive into mine, I wanna give a shout out to Tyler here. If you're looking for tips on optimizing the, the database, when to shard, when to partition, setting up um, uh, replicas, batching, streaming, go look at this talk. I'm not gonna cover it, he did a great job. All right, also, another great one. I can do all things through Postgres, Todd. That was a great talk. Covers complex indexes, searching techniques, uh, finding adjacent rows, that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's talk about Ecto, Postgres, and deployment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow through this one, all right? Your number one priority, set up a process set of rolling updates, uh, blue-green strategy, right? That's what this graph looks like. The big piece of this is to run migrations before booting, and then when it fails to run migrations, you, you roll back to their last good state, right? Once you have that, you're gonna be so, situ and you use the, the right locks, you're gonna be so protected from big issues, okay? All right, here's, here, that was blue-green, this is rolling update. Okay. Next up, the migration lock and DDL transactions. And depending on how you configure these, it can cause big problems. So let's learn a little bit more about them. For Ecto, the primary and default way locks and transactions are used is one, to ensure that only one node is running migration at a time. This is the migration lock. Number two, reverse an error safely while migrating. This is the DDL transaction. Uh, the trouble comes in when you remove these protections, and sometimes you have to. Removing one of these is necessary. If you're creating an index, you need to do it concurrently. If you're doing it concurrently, you can't do it in a transaction, so you have to remove those, those locks. You're removing your protections. That's a problem. All right, so let's look at, a little bit deeper at these locks. Let's start with a normal migration, creating a table with some test data. Pretty simple, right? Migration lock is still there. DDL transaction, that's still there. We didn't turn it off. We're gonna run a migration, some seek. We're we wanna see the SQL, right? So I want you to notice the two flags up there, log, uh, log migrator SQL and log migrations SQL. There's two flags there. One will migrate, uh, sorry, one will log the SQL used by your migration, and then one will log the, the SQL that's used by the, the migrator, right? The thing that's running your stuff. In the first migration output here, you're gonna see two begins, right? The first one is starting the transaction for the migration lock. It obtains an exclusive share on the schema versions, which prevents other nodes from moving forward You know, until that transaction is finished. This is great. Then you see the second one. That's your DDL transaction. This is also great. This, what this is doing is just making sure that if an error occurs during your migration, it rolls back. Granted, it all went well. They commit, and you're done. That's great. This is perfect. Normal. Let's look at another one. I'm going to turn off the locks on this one because they're not compatible with these um, indexes or the one down there, right? I got the concurrently flag uh, set as true. Uh, I want that because uh, concurrently won't lock those records for reading and writing. 
That's, that's what you should do. But I have to turn off those migration logs and the, the DDL transaction, so I remove some of my safety. So let's run it, let's see the output, and it's a little bit more problematic. There's just no begins and no commits, it's just there. If I have 10 instances of the app running, each of those 10 instances are gonna to try to run this. And, and, and in this example, I've got a, like a lot of test data being inserted. So I'm not gonna realize it, but I'm gonna have like way more test data in that database than I realized, right? Because I've removed the lock. That's a problem. Um, also, if the index ended up uh, failing to create for whatever reason, you know, like then the, the migration has failed, it'll stop there. You know, it'll raise an exception, your migration won't, won't complete, and therefore you won't get your schema migration version in there. But when you rerun it, you're gonna get that test data reinserted, right? That's bad, you don't wanna do that. So let's think above a better way to do this for Postgres. So in, in Ecto SQL, uh, Ecto SQL 3.9.0, which is unreleased, <laughs> I was really hoping it'd be here. <laughs> Uh, there is a new opt-in option to uh, leverage an advisory lock for migration. So right now it uses database transactions. This is an advisory lock. Let's uh, look to how to see that. Um, that's it. Let me, let me just blow that up. <laughs> there you go. All right, quick shout out to this person who raised the issue on the safe effect of migrations repo. I'll talk more about that in a minute. All they had to do was prompt and ask a question. That's all they had to do. And, then, and, and now we get this option, right? So if you turn this on for your Postgres database on Ecto SQL Master right now, and three, I think it's gonna come out in 3.9.0, um, you don't have to lose your migration lock, which means that now your 10 instances will appropriately wait for the one instance to finish. So we've solved that problem, right? This isn't a new concept, by the way. This is not like unsafe. This happens in the Ecto uh, XQL adapter right now. So they, they do the same thing there. So this isn't brand new. We just made it available in Postgres. Um, I think that the issue is still uh, there for Microsoft SQL, and I'm not sure about SQLite, but uh, focusing on Postgres for a moment. Okay, so the biggest difference now, now that we have that configuration option, you just don't turn off that migration lock, and now you can see the, uh, the output of the SQL there. So now we just got a, an advisory lock. If it obtains it, it moves on. If it doesn't, it just keeps on waiting and waiting and waiting. All right. Cool, so that covers the migration locks and the DDL transaction problems, but what about the SQL locks? There are so many scenarios where small adjustments can make a huge difference, and they might only matter <laughs> in your specific environment. So, go here. <laughs> your specific environment will dictate how much a SQL lock is going to matter. A lot of times it doesn't matter, but in, a lot, in other cases it does. So, uh, in those scenarios are gonna be spilled out a little bit more, uh, spelled out a little bit more on this, uh, this repo. So this work was sponsored by Fly.io. It accepts community contributions. You can find it here. There's also a big guide uh, that uh, goes through all of these scenarios. So, uh, if you miss the rest of what I'm talking about, just go there. <laughs> all right, but out of those recipes, I'm gonna pick one to highlight. How to add a foreign key reference safely and how to add a constraint to an existing column safely, such as a not null constraint, right? So uh, f first of all, foreign key constraint uh, references are constraints, so treat them in the same way. Um, adding a constraint to a large table will, by default, scan the entire table, and that's going to be your problem point. You don't want to do that. Uh, instead, you want to separate the, val the creation of the constraint and the validation of the constraint. That's easy, right? This, is, this isn't hard. It's just knowing about, knowing about the option. All right. Yeah, that's it. Validate. That's the only change you gotta make. And then, then in the next migration, you tell it to validate. This is gonna let that constraint be created and then all records going forward will be validated, but all your existing stuff won't be validated. So you have to go validate them in the next migration. And that's where your problems could show up. <laughs> so if you have to make some adjustments, then you need a data migration. Speaking of, schema migrations, for the most part, have guardrails because of the functions that Ecto provides. It's a matter of knowing which options to use and when, but what about those pesky ones? Data migrations uh, are the types of migrations where the schema isn't changing. It's the data, DDL versus DML. Um, they're necessary. We got to do them. But uh, we don't want to <laughs> yeet them into production, right? Uh, the better of us is going to take a snapshot <laughs> before you do it, but uh, you don't really want to do that. Okay, so how do we ensure safety for data migration? So there's three keys. We're going to look at some code. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're just going to go through it really quick, right? The first one is batching, second, throttling, third, resiliency. Right? It's assuming that your data migrations are changing more than a couple tens of thousands of records. Right? If you're changing 100, eh, it may not matter. Right? Just go ahead and stuff some SQL in there and run it. But for big, big, big data migrations, this is where, this is where you're going to need the, the keys of safety. 
So the process of safe migrations, uh, safe data migrations will look a little bit like this. First, separate data and schema migrations. They don't live together. Don't put them in the same. Ma make them different, right? Paginate through the IDs and need the change. That means you need, to be you need to be able to find them. You need to read and lock the records, calculate the needed changes, write the needed changes up, and then slow things down a little bit. All right, so we're gonna write a data migration. First, we're gonna generate a data migration into a separate folder. Use that migrations path there. All right, now as we discussed earlier, the database transactions will be present, so you'll wanna be like aware of that. So depending on what you're using, use those, right, um, use those settings. All right, and first up, we need to batch. It's resource prohibitive to, in databases to like change millions of records all in like one statement. You're, you're gonna eat up memory, right? You're gonna eat up CPU, and that's gonna choke other connections and other things that are going on. So you have to kind of batch things. And batching things implies that we'll need to paginate, right? So first, limit offset. Don't do it. There you go. Database uh, cursors. Um, this sounds like a good option. And when I say cursor-based pagination, I mean in a database sense. You're going to hear cursor-based, and uh, you're going to be thinking about APIs. Um, it, yeah. But there is a real database cursor. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, we can't really use that either because it relies on a database transaction. I mean, there is, it, it, you can kind of use it, but it gets complicated. So that leaves us with key set pagination. So you're going to order filter uh, by ID, right? And do it, do it in batches of like 1,000. So like limit and offset is bad because it's a, it'll scan all the way up to that record that you're at regardless. So it's just going to, it's, the first page will be great. But then once you get to the end of it, it's just going to be awful. You're not going to be able to paginate um, with that. Key set avoids that problem. So that's, that's, the, that's the good thing. All right. So remember, we want to paginate. We want to do this. We want to find. We want to read and lock. And then we want to update. Okay, first, uh, at this point, we're going to you know, generate that, that migration. You probably know what this looks like. Here's a snippet. Don't worry about the code. This is just to give you an idea, all right? So we're going to do def up. We're going to throttle changes in batches. We're going to give it a query function and a do change function, right? This is all in the safe ecto migrations guide. Um, all right, so first, we're going to um, page through the records. And notice here that I'm doing p and posts. Don't reference your application code in here. <laughs> I know it's so tempting, but, but don't do it, really. Like, your migrations are a snapshot in time that will probably never get run again, but your application code will continue to evolve. So you might drop columns later, and so that schema just won't make sense when your new developer is coming up and running migrations. So don't do it. As much as you can, don't do it. I'll say it again, don't do it. <laughs> just don't. All right, we'll look at the next one. We're going to open up a transaction, right? Repo, transaction. We're going to read the records again for real, right? Oh, let me go back. All right. You see the, the page query. We're going to P and post. We're going to only select the ID. We're going to do our pagination thing. This is just key set uh, things here. Um, but we're just getting the ID, all right? So in this, we're going to get a batch of IDs, and then we're going to reread those, those records. We're going to lock those records. We're going to reduce on those records, get the mutations that we need, the mutation function is whatever you need it to be, but it's just it needs to return nil or, or the, a map of changes that needs to happen based on whatever you need to do. Then return the IDs. Then we're going to update. We're going to use insert all here, um, which is another way of saying upsert. That's going to change all the existing records in there. This just this this may, just may not be very recognizable to you, so I want to introduce it to you. Insert all it doesn't necessarily mean new records. This is about up. We're literally only updating existing records in this one, but notice the on conflict. That's what helps you out with that, and the conflict target. Those are those are the options that you're going to need in an insert. All right, you can use up, uh, update all. You can you can try to do a repo like dot update and then just iterate through each of them, but that requires a schema, and that's where you get an application code. You probably don't want to do that. Right? This is probably what you want. Um, the placeholder is also pretty cool because that means you only send the timestamp once for the whole batch instead of like all the time for each of the records, that's, that saves, that makes, makes things easier. And then the glue code, right? You're gonna, you're gonna page through it, you're gonna get those, pat, those, those IDs, and you're just gonna make this stuff like talk to each other. And the important part here, process sleep. Oh, data safety key right to, uh, to you right there. That's the only thing, data safety key right to, that's all you gotta do. Just in your loop, you gotta slow things down because you got other processes that are talking to the database, so you don't want to mess things up for those processes. Okay, 
Last thing, resiliency. And what I mean by resiliency is that you might run into an error. You can't rerun a migration. So you got a couple of options that you can do here. You can update the data migration code to account for that weird data and rerun it. That means you have to worry about item potency. Uh, that'll make things complicated. Another one is you have to write another data migration to capture that weird data. At this point, you're probably doing the 80-20 thing. Right? That gets a lot of effort. Really what you want is you want an opportunity to see the effect of the change before the data migration takes effect. You need an observable, a dry runnable process. Again, we want to improve the process. We don't want to just brute force it with code commits and redeploys, right? Okay, so we're, that wraps up that. I'm going to end with some tools. Migration linters. These tools will validate for safe migrations and ask you to like safely validate that you're doing, you know what you're doing, right? This is to help keep things from, from biting you. And uh, for what it's worth, Excellent Migrations um, has a credo check, so you might, that, that's pretty cool. You can put that in your CI um, workflow. Another tool is Phoenix Live Dashboard. There's some great Ecto tools in there. Um, you can see, like, especially with the PSQL extras, you can see like long queries, unused indexes, that kind of stuff. Um, there is going to be an Ecto page, I think, in Phoenix Live Dashboard where you can see like, the, the current status of migrations, what's run, what hasn't. Maybe one day we'll be able to run it from there. It's not there yet. Of course, you got your own telemetry events. Go look at those. Okay, lastly, the tool that doesn't exist yet. So we know what it needs. It needs to change data in bulk. It needs to be observable. It needs to be reportable. It needs to be dry runnable, all those features. And we don't also want everyone just willy-nilly migrating stuff. So it needs some sort of paper trail. So to be honest, in this room, this tool probably already exists, but I haven't found it. So if you know what it is, let me know. <laughs> um, or it may just not be re like ready to be made public. All right, but let's, think, let, let's assume that it's not there. This is, this, is what it could, uh, this is what it could do. This is what it could look like. All right, snapshot that. Yeah, everyone got it? Okay. <laughs> it could look really cool. And maybe your app does this. But this doesn't exist for what it's worth, right? And if I get nerd sniped on this idea, please go do it. Like, make it good. I would love it. I don't need to do it. All right, earlier, um, wrapping up. I talked about education being a big way to help incidents and developers. So I am launching this. It's not there yet. All that's there is a, is a sign-up form. So um, think, uh, who knows about Tailwind, right? Phoenix people, yeah, you know about Tailwind. Okay, there's Tailwind CSS and then there's Tailwind UI. All right, hex docs, that's Tailwind CSS. That's free, everyone lo loves the docs there, they're amazing. But if you need those recipes, you need a little extra, that's Tailwind UI. Think of Ecto in production as being Ecto UI. <laughs> Tell you, uh, think of it as a, so those copy pasteable kind of res recipes, uh, articles, more learning materials than what Hexdocs already gives you. Um, all right, so ectoinproduction.com. If you go there and you want to learn more about that, all it is is just a sign up page. Just put your email in there and I'll contact you later. And that's not all the educational material. There's also Hexdocs. And there's also these other places. Use the index uh, Luke.com. Not Ecto related, but very good uh, resources. And of course, there's Groxio, Elixir School, and Prague Prague um, that have um, good material. All right, so thank you so much for sticking with me. Uh, recapping one last time, we went over the human aspect of bad migrations and how to process them better. We reviewed DDL, transactions, migration lock mechanisms. We learned the keys to safe data migrations. And lastly, there's some tools there uh, that maybe you learned about. So I sincerely hope that you learned something today and that your experience, past or present, you can contribute that back to the community so we don't make the same mistakes. Right? So my name is David Bernheisel. I'm the co-host of Thinking Elixir, um, and you can find me on Twitter. So have a nice rest of your conference. <laughs>